take it away. Thanks, Kendra. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, just a little bit of schedule of events. I'm going to introduce Pete a little bit, then have his presentation, and then we'll have a kind of question and answer session at the end. So without further ado, reading Pete's biography, um, Pete received a bachelor's degree with honors in biology and environmental conservation from the University of Colorado and a PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis. Pete worked at the Wildlife Conservation Society for 10 years, first as their New York headquarter, first in their New York headquarters, and then as part of the Africa and North American programs. He has studied ferruginous hawks hawks in North America, avian community ecology in Kenya, and large herbivore ecology and herding systems in Tanzania. Pete has helped plan and carry out conservation strategy strategies in Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, the Congo, Cambodia, Tanzania, and the United States. His publications appear in Conservation Biology, Biological Conservation, the Public Science Public Library of Science, Human Ecology, Landscape and Urban Planning, Landscape Ecology, and Science. And he has co-authored um, the book, Conservation, Linking Ecology and Economics and Culture. So without further ado, here's Pete. Thanks, Kendra. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, for joining and tuning in. Um, this, is a, um, this is kind of a exciting one. This is one of the, 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 our, our biggest projects to date. Um, and I'm excited to, to sort of share it. Um, it's a little different than, than uh, may often happen because it, this is very much a work in progress. We're just diving into this um, right now. And I think you'll get a sense for that. Um, but um, this is a, it's a, it's a neat project. We're, we're, we're throwing a lot of dogs at it more than we've done on any project in a long time. And, um, and so um, I'll just, I'll just dive right in. I'm going to go kind of fast through it because there are a lot of parts and I want to leave time for questions and feedback and stuff like that. Um, I will try to keep an eye on the, on the chat, but if I, if I'm not paying attention or, um, or miss it, um, um, Sarah, or Kendra, if you see one, feel free to stop me if, if somebody wants a clarification or, you know, needs something like that. Um, and with that, I think we'll just, uh, we'll just sort of dive in. Um, I'm not going to give you a whole overview of, of, of all the things that, that we at Working Dogs for Conservation do, um, but this is, this is basically uh, it. We're about 25 years old now. Um, we've, um, we've got about oh, 44 active dogs and five or six candidates always kind of in the, in the pool. We work all over the world. We um, have, have worked uh, to date in about 22 different countries, 32 states. Um, and we do a lot of different things. You know, sometimes we consult, sometimes we run projects ourselves, and sometimes we do capacity building where we train other people to do the work that we're doing. And it all tends to fall into a few different categories. And um, some of it's ecological monitoring. And you know, that's just a fancy term for counting animals or finding where they live so that those areas can be protected. Um, we also do wildlife crime, you know, uh, law enforcement work, you know, stopping poaching, trafficking, things like that. Um, and we do, uh, but this one, this project falls under biosecurity and biosecurity is just a fancy way of saying any, the, you know, the threats that can reproduce themselves like invasive species or in this case, diseases. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, and then recently now we do more environmental justice, either helping communities that have, have historically not reaped the benefits of conservation or have paid a disproportionate costs of environmental degradation things like that. So um, those are all the, the, the sort of major categories and, um, and uh, that, that we work on. But now I'm going to just zero in on, the, on this, um, this sort of sheep work. And um, this is the sheep team. Um, it's uh, that there's the, the, the person in the upper left there is uh, Amy Hurt. She's one of the founders of the organization. Um, and um, she is uh, really one of the most experienced conservation dog trainers in the world. She's worked on all sorts of different um, topics, and and that's why she's part of this one. Is this is a this is a complicated, difficult target for dogs, a difficult project, and so we we needed to have somebody who can really um, who can um, tackle um, uh, difficult issues and and do it on the fly. So she's our our fearless leader. She's the director of special programs for us, and then next to her with the dog in the red vest, that's um, uh, Paige Smith. She's a canine field specialist. Amanda Ott with, uh, with Sully on the rock there. Um, she's our um, canine teams training coordinator. Um, Michelle Vasquez leaning on the truck there at the bottom. 
She is, um, she's also a canine field specialist. She's, she's actually part-time moving to South Dakota um, State to do her master's uh, as, part of this, uh, as part of this project. Um, so she's gonna be inter in intimately involved. And then um, that's me in the bottom there on the bottom right. And what you'll see is I'm not a professional dog handler. Those are my, those are my dogs, they're just bird dogs. Um, but I'm, a, I'm an ecologist. I came at this from the, from the conservation side of all of it. And so um, you know, my, my emphasis is on the conservation and the outcomes and I don't, I don't handle or train the dogs but I set it all up and then, um, and then go to other people into doing the hard work to, <laughs> to make it happen. So um, as Kendra said, I spent a lot of time, a lot of my career was in Africa. And when I moved back from Tanzania, I came to, um, to here in Bozeman to run the Yellowstone program for the Wildlife Conservation Society. And a friend of mine at, at the time when I was moving back, she said, what do you wanna work on? And I said, I'd love to work on wild sheep. And she said, stay away from sheep. They're, they're controversial, they're too difficult, stay away. You, you, you do better working on bison. <laughs> and that was 15 years ago when, when bison, you know, we hadn't made a lot of progress on bison too. So I, I took her advice and we stayed away for, for quite a long time. Um, and then uh, in 2019, um, you know, over, over a number of years, I'd become pals with, with Kurt Alt. And um, he said, hey, I wanna talk to you about some projects with dogs and, and wild sheep. And I told him, I said, you know, I don't know, what do you think? And he said, no, we've got a good collaborative foundation and the time is right, let's go for it. Um, so I've teased Kurt and called him the cockeyed optimist around this, but um, this is, as you'll see, it has really um, come together and he was, he was really right. So with um, encouragement um, in, in the very beginning and some introductions from the Wild Sheep Foundation, we started working um, initially with Montana State University and then very quickly, um, Kevin Hurley, who's on, on tonight, and, and Kurt and others opened up their Rolodex and started introducing us to people um, and, um, and, and talking about the projects with agencies. And so we've grown just from Montana State to a whole bunch of agencies, other universities and, and um, tribes now are also involved. And we're really excited. And we we're, we're actually have participation and interest from a big swath of, of wild sheep range here in North America. And we're really excited about that because there are a lot of people watching and who are, who are and, and participating and supporting it by um, submitting and sharing training samples. I'll tell you a lot more about that. You'll hear a lot more about that in a minute. But, um, but we're, really, um, we're really pleased. And, and you know, even at this beginning early stage before we've, um, before we've really finished and pr the proof of concept and, and perfected the methods, there are a lot of people supporting it. So, um, that's a big um, thank you to the Wild Sheep Foundation and who, you know, it's a real testimony to the collaborative relationships that have been built um, and, and that we're, we're really taking advantage of that. And I think we're going to see the results um, from that. So um, here, here's what we're up to. There are three, three big parts of this, this sort of project. Um, and the first one is, is real-time screening um, of animals for, for disease. As, as all of you probably know, uh, mycoplasma ovinomoniae or MOV um, is, a, is, a, is a nasty pathogen for, for domestic sheep. Is, there's also some growing data that it's not great for, or sorry, for wild sheep. There's also some data now that's, that are suggesting that it's not great for domestic sheep either. Um, but, um, but as you know, it can get into wild sheep herds and we get all age whole herd die-offs. There's also some um, new data suggesting that there are chronic shedders who will just undermine lamb recruitment so um, it's, it's really important to know if, if animals are, are diseased, number one, and given the need to restore wild sheep to lots of places they've been gone from, or to augment populations, or even just to capture collar and monitor populations, we need to know if the animals were, or that are being handled are, are diseased. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about what's, hard, what's difficult about that and how the dogs are, are, are helping it. Um, helping to, to make that a little bit more, um, uh, you know, streamline that process a little bit. So I'll dive into that, but, but before I do, I just want to mention the other two parts. You know, the other is, is, is to actually do that screening animals on the mountain, non-invasively, without capturing animals. Um, so I'll tell you how we do that. And then um, the third part is to, um, to develop uh, some new tools, some new ways to help managers, livestock, land, and, and wildlife managers keep sheep separate, domestic and wild sheep 
keep them apart and prevent disease transmission. So I'll, I'll touch on all three of those as we, as we go through. But as, as I mentioned, and as, as you all know, um, sheep are, are, are a species that, that requires a lot of management. Um, they're gone from a lot of places they used to be. Um, their populations are lower in many places than they used to be. And so that means that a lot of times agencies, um, tribes, uh, parks, the, you know, whoever is, is managing those animals has to handle them. And sometimes that's to move them. Sometimes it's just to, to collar and monitor them. And, um, and, and increasingly there are new programs that, that called test and remove to, um, to, to remove these chronically shedding animals. But, and, and these are huge intensive operations. The photo you can see on the left there, that's a drop net. Some of you may have seen this kind of thing. Animals are, are, are baited in and they'll feed under there for a couple of days and then they, they catch a whole bunch at once or some operations actually catch uh, animals with helicopters um, with net guns or darting and then, and then they'll have to move them. But um, when these operations are going on, it's, it's intense. Um, there's a, there are a lot of people, there's a lot to do um, and um, there are a huge number of logistics, you know, even, even beyond the, the thousand dollar an hour helicopter that, that has to go and, and catch everybody. And so as, as things stand right now, what has to happen when, if we want to know the disease status of these animals, samples have to be taken in a manner like this. You know, you've got all these animals being handled at once and, and sent to, to Washington the state of Washington, the Washington Animal Diagnostic Disease, Disease Diagnostic Lab, um, and they have to be sent away. So what happens is captures have to happen early in the week so that FedEx packages can make it to Washington, and then everybody waits. Everybody just sits and waits for these, these uh, results to come back. And um, that's a huge disturbance logistically. It costs extra money. Um, you know, it prolongs these operations. And importantly, animals have to be kept in stock trailers, not only kept in stock trailers, but kept separate from each other so that they're not transmitting disease. So it's stressful for the animals, it's slower for people, it's expensive. So the idea is, can we take methods that have been developed for human diseases? Many of you have probably heard about the cancer dogs at, at University of Pennsylvania. We collaborate closely with them. Um, these are similar methods. Can we, can we dogs detect the disease? in those animals in real time, in the fields, to allow those managers to have an answer much more quickly and to act on it you know, more quickly, or use it in combination with the other, the other methods if that's, if that's what they would like to do. But the idea is that we help them prevent moving animals who are diseased or knowing which animals are diseased, whether they are even at all, and, and, and filing that information back into management in, in real time. So um, it'll, hopefully it'll speed things up and um, provide a really reliable tool that, that everybody can, can you know, use to, to improve sheep management and, and protect and make it easier to either establish wild, new wild herds, augment existing ones, or re remove animals, make the existing ones healthier. So how do we do that? How do the dogs actually do this stuff? Well, we, we work on a number of different sample types, and I'm gonna show you how the dogs work. This is Benny. He's sitting in our, our facility. We've got a facility just outside of Missoula. Um, and that thing in front of him is called a scent wheel. Um, it's how we present scent or odor samples to the dogs. On the end of each one of those arms is a little can that looks like a, um, it, it, it looks like a powdered sugar shaker. You know, it's a little stainless steel can. It's got a screw on lid and, and holes in it. And um, inside there, we can put different samples. Um, in this case, we put um, the scat, the, the pellets, the fecal pellets from, from sheep um, who are wild, um, sheep who are either infected or uninfected, and the dogs can tell us this is an infected animal versus this is a, not an infected animal. And um, they'll walk around and test all of, those, all of those samples. We do this, we do it in a double blind way. Um, and the reason for that is, is twofold. Number one, this is, a, this is a, um, a, a pilot, you know, it's never been done before. So we wanna demonstrate in a rigorous way that, it, that the dogs are actually doing it and doing it correctly. And, and the reason it has to be double blind is because dogs are actually better at reading human body language than humans are. And um, so many of you may have heard the story of, of, of Clever Hans. Clever Hans was a horse who was purported to do math. 
And um, everybody, including his, his trainer and his handler, believed that he could do math. And he couldn't do math. What he could do, because horses are like dogs, they're very good at reading human body language, he read, he read the crowd's body language. So he would stop, they'd ask him a math question, he would stomp his foot and, and he would watch the crowd. And when he got to the right answer, everybody would look up at him and he would stop. So we need to make, we need to structure our experiments here in a way that we're not prompting the dogs to give us the answer that we want. So um, what you see there, that's, um, that's Finn. Um, and she's a, she's a chocolate lab. Um, she's one of the dogs on this, on this project. And she's in a, in a closed in room. Um, and on the right side on the wall there, you can see a camera. That's a remote camera for, for observation. Um, and it's pointed at, at her on the, on the wheel there. And then um, what that allows us to do is be outside the room and to watch from outside the room. And we, um, we can then know if she stops, alerts at the right um, target. And um, in this example, the target, which is positive sheep scat, scat from an infected sheep, is in, um, is in port number two. So it's right there in, in front. And in the other ports, what you'll see are what we call distractor odors. These are just other, other things. So it could be negative, scat from a negative, a non-infected sheep. It could be um, cat food, blank, you know, just a blank uh, filters. Uh, you know, whatever, hair gel, anything, just so that there are other odors. Because if they, you know, otherwise, if, if there's only one can that's got odor in it of any kind, then dog can just stop there and say, well, that must be the one I'm looking for. So um, sh what she does is she'll go around, she'll check at those ports. And then um, uh, at, the, at the, the, it, the correct one where she finds her target, she'll hold her nose. She'll put her nose right on the target and stay there. And then if you listen carefully, you may hear in the background, you'll hear a beep. And that's just like a click. That's just like clicker training. That's the signal to Finn that she's been correct, that she's got the right answer. So outside, Abby, who was on the, on the, um, on the video earlier, reads and the, the observer says port number two. The person who does know the answer says correct and pushes the button and then it goes beep and, and, um, and Finn gets a food reward. Um, and, and so you'll, you'll see that happen right here. Let me see if I can run this for you guys. There she goes. I hope you guys can hear that. She closed in. She says, "Find it." There's. So there's her alert, and there's her. She's getting her reward. She gets her food reward because she was correct. So that's how we. That's how we have tested this initially to see can dogs detect the disease. I'll show you some data and some uh, results here in a second. Um, how, how they do it. Um, but basically, that, that's, we'll use a modified version of that in the field. So when, when sheep are captured, they'll bring the, the samples, whether those are nasal swabs or, um, or scat, to a central place, and then the dogs will screen them, and then we'll give those information, the data from those, back to the, the managers and the biologists right then. So, oops. Okay, so like I said, this is a proof of concept. First question is, can they even do this? You know, can they detect it? And if so, then how good are they at it? And we just use the standard, the standard measures that any um, epidemiological, you know, medical study uses of sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is if it is there, if it's a positive sample, will they detect it? And specificity is, um, you know, will they alert to negative or incorrectly say a target odor is there? So it's the, the two different ways to miss. One is to miss one that's there and one's to think it's there when it's not. And then accuracy is just a combination of the two, as you can see there. So the number of positives and the number of true negatives that they get correct over the total number of trials. So positives correct, negatives correct, and misses. Um, so that'll, that gives us the, the data um, for, for, for what I'm about to show you here. And um, for reasons I will not go into, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, we've, we've worked on a lot of different targets here. Um, so we've tested them on breath samples from sheep that were captured via um, surgical masks. And that was part of a pilot study to, to examine whether that kind of a method would be possible for COVID. Um, and we used mycoplasma as a, as a model pathogen for COVID. So we tested whether they could do it. Um, they were 100% sensitive. 
um, they did a fabulous job. Um, they did um, give us a, a few false um, ones, and, but their accuracy was 84%. So that was early days in the pandemic and we were really, we were really pleased by that. Um, they also worked on the nasal swabs with people and got similar, similar results, accuracy of 93%. Um, but the ones that are really, really um, uh, sort of important for us are the, are the scat and the nasal swabs um, for sheep. But what, what the dogs have demonstrated is they can do that um, um, for, for these, uh, for, for sheep pathogens as well. Here's an interesting little wiggle with this. We took, we took one of the dogs and only trained her on um, cultured mycoplasma ovi pneumoniae. So that's what those little red um, dishes are. That's, that's a culture dish. And we just cultured the bug and we trained her on that. And then we presented her with wild in sheep scat from an infected wild sheep. And the question was, if she's trained to detect the bug itself, will she detect, will she alert to a wild sheep scat um, from an infected sheep? And the answer was no, <laughs> she didn't. Um, she had a zero sensitivity. She didn't alert to a single one of them. So what that suggests to us, even though the rest of our dogs are getting accuracies of, of uh, 80, 90 to 100%. So what that tells us is the dogs are not detecting mycoplasma itself in the dung, but what they're detecting is a metabolic change in the animal. So it might be their microbiome, it might be a metabolite from the bug, it might be something else, but it's something other than the bug that's passing through them. And that, that may become uh, important a little bit later on when we start thinking about animals out on the landscape. The reason we're, we're, we're doing all these different targets is because we know that, that in their nasal cavities, um, and in their upper respiratory tract, there's lots of mycoplasma. And, and when they're acutely infected with it, it's everywhere, it, there's lots of it. So that's gonna be a very easy target for them to use in the field. But the reason we wanna use dung as well is because of this second part, which is screening animals sort of out there on the mountain, non-invasive screening without having to capture animals, right? So that's a, that's a big deal because what it means like I said earlier, it's you know thousand dollars an hour to run a helicopter. It's dangerous for biologists. It's dangerous for the animals. It's stressful. It's expensive. Um, if we can send dogs out in a wild, you know, setting on a landscape like that, whether it's with domestic sheep or um, with wild sheep, and and survey for the for the disease, that's going to be a really powerful tool to then help help uh, conservationists and managers and livestock and wildlife and land managers to know what's happening with the animals in, their, um, in, the, in the areas that they manage. And, and that's, a, that's a very big deal to do non-invasive screening of a free ranging um, wild species. And the way we do that is not by catching the animals or getting even close to them to get nasal swabs or samples like that. It's, it's by picking up their poop, <laughs> by finding these fecal um, uh, samples. So um, that's what we've done. We've headed out. Um, and um, this, is, this is collecting some fecal samples from Wild Horse Island here in Montana. Um, these are uninfected sheep. They don't have mycoplasma ovi pneumoniae. Um, some of you may know that character there on the right. That's um, Doug Chadwick, uh, the National Geographic, and he's written about so many different um, uh, uh, wildlife sort of targets. Um, and the neat thing about, um, about uh, Wild Horse Island is that, that um, it's got, a, it's got a, a, a significant population of sheep. They're well studied. We know their, um, their disease status. So we can use those to, to, um, to, um, uh, as, as distractor odors, as negative. But we can also do experiments and, and, and know, what, um, you know where we can find scat and things like that. So what's going to make this part possible for us is we need to know how long that odor profile is viable out on the landscape. So we know that dogs, we know that dogs can, can with very good results, recognize from freshly collected scats, scats that were collected and put straight into the, to the freezer. What we don't know is, will it work with scats that have been sitting out in the, in the sun and the rain and the wind for a week, two weeks or a month? Um, and so that's what we need to do. We need to take these positive scats and leave them out and then present them to dogs, you know, a week, two weeks, a month after to know whether that odor profile persists. And because we're doing some of the mechanistic work, I'll tell you about in a second, to figure out what is 
creating that odor profile, we'll be able to, to, um, to find out more about what the actual signal is, what the dogs are using um, to, to, um, to recognize that, um, that, uh, that odor profile. And um, so that's, a, that's work in progress. We'll, we'll hopefully come back in a year, maybe two, and tell you all, all about that um, as, it, as it all happens. The last piece here is spatial separation. It's great if we know, if we can tell what animals are, are diseased and not, but it's even better if we can prevent disease transmission between wild and, and domestic sheep. And if you look at that picture in the bottom there, you can see there's a, there's a livestock guardian dog. Those are domestic sheep close to them. But look in the back there, you see that big dark fellow in the back, right back there? That's a ram, that's a bighorn ram. Who's come, who's come in to, to consort with that, uh, with that band of, of domestic sheep. So we know that this happens. We know that these can lead to um, disease events. So one of um, disease transmission events. So one of Kurt's um, questions to us was, hey, can we use dogs to, to do this, um, to keep them separate, just like we do to keep carnivores like coyotes or mountain lions or wolves out or bears out of sheep, um, sheep herds or flocks, bands. Um, can we do the same um, to prevent wild sheep from doing it? So <clears throat> we convened uh, a bunch of, of, you know, most of ours, I should back up. Most of our work is with detection or, or tracking or um, what we call discrimination. This is a discrimination project um, telling the difference between two closely um, related smells. So this is a different kind. This is, these are different dog disciplines, right? So what we looked at is three different types of, of, of dogs. Um, that are that are out there sort of working on the landscape. Some of you may have in, even encountered some of these dogs. The first one on the right there is called, is named Gracie. She works up in Glacier. She's a border collie. She's handled by um, uh, a fellow named Mark Beal. Um, and she's, they call her the bark ranger. Her job is to keep wild sheep and wild goats out of the heavily trafficked areas in Glacier National Park. So parking lots, trailheads, you know, heavily trafficked trails because some of those animals can get, get a little bit aggressive and, and, and with, with humans, it can get dangerous. So Gracie works on a long line and her job is to keep them, um, keep them to push them out. And she gently sort of pushes them out. She uses, if many of you know of border collies, you know what they call the border collie stare. And she'll often do that. She stares at them. She'll walk very slowly up toward them and just pushes them gently out of the, out of the area. The second sort of type of dog that we, we looked at um, is in the middle there. That's a Karelian bear dog. And it's a, that's a very different process. The Karelian's job is, is, is aversive conditioning. It's to harass a bear and tell them, get out of here. We don't want you here. And, and their job is to teach them to stay away. And th they're also used primarily in campgrounds and, and in, in places where we don't want bears coming in. So the question was, can we do this with sheep? And then the last one was livestock guardian dogs. Um, these are the classics. A lot of people call them big whites. So they're, they're uh, Pyrenees. Most people know Pyrenees. There's also Maremis, Akbash, and some people will use a, another big dog called an Anatolian Shepherd, um, who are all, and, but mostly those dogs are used for carnivores. They're used to, um, to keep carnivores out of, out of sheep. And so, so the question is, can we do this um, for, to keep wild sheep separate? So we polled a bunch of practitioners in, in different, um, in different uh, uh, among these different disciplines and asked them anecdotally, does this work? Do you know anybody who does it? Has it ever happened? And what we learned is that a lot of the livestock guardian dogs will just do it naturally, particularly with elk, but, but all, it, also with sheep. And these livestock guardian dogs also, if their owner, demonstrates that behavior, they can reinforce the behavior. So we've had multiple stories from sheep producers who have seen in the presence of their dogs, they'll, they'll see sheep coming, wild sheep coming near their band of domestic sheep and they'll get on the four-wheeler and they'll chase them off. And then after that, the dogs say, oh, right, I guess that's what we do. And, and they start keep doing it. So there are some interesting and encouraging results here with, with the, um, the livestock guardian dogs. At some point, we may explore the, the border collies or the, the Corellians, but the problem with both of those is that they require a human handler, a human presence all the time. And a wild sheep can come in the middle of the night. It can come in remote areas. It's just too human intensive. It requires too much human presence 
to make it as reliable as the livestock guardian dogs. So um, that's the, the avenue that we're gonna, gonna look into and pursue. And, and one of the things that we, we did was we brought some producers and some livestock managers, wildlife managers together to talk about it. And one of the things that we've learned is that yes, they can do this, but a lot of producers, and I'm talking domestic sheep producers now, don't want livestock guardian dogs because quite frankly, they're a pain. <laughs> they're, they're difficult dogs. They're, they can, they're loud. And the, 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 with the, um, the, the received wisdom and how you train them is you put them out with the sheep and you let them socialize with the sheep and you don't go near them and you don't mess with them because if they get too bonded to people, they're gonna to wanna to come back and be with the people and they're not gonna to wanna to be with the sheep and protect them. One of the problems with that though, is that they reach, just like humans, um, um, they reach an adolescent stage where they test boundaries and they, they get naughty, quite frankly. Um, some of them will turn to eating lambs. Some of them will just disappear. They'll go on walkabouts for a while. Um, and so they can be really difficult to keep. So that's, that's, a, that's a, the first barrier that a lot of the, the producers identified. The second one is they said, yeah, that's fine, but I keep, I keep these dogs to keep carnivores out so that I don't incur economic losses, right? So that pencils for the, for the producers. There's, a, there's an economic financial return for them in order to, to keep these dogs when they're preventing carnivores from coming in. There's no economic benefit from preventing wild sheep. So it's tougher to get these producers to pay the money to have a dog, to keep feeding it, to put up with the, the disruptions and the, you know, they make noise, they bark at the neighbors, they, they'll, they, and some of these dogs can be quite dangerous. When we're out surveying with our trained detection dogs and we encounter livestock guardian dogs, we end the survey because they, they, they are instinctively and are, and are trained to be and are reinforced to be dog aggressive. They don't want coyotes, they don't want wolves anywhere near those sheep. And so they'll, they'll you know, sometimes they'll even come after people, but we, we keep them separate. So they're, they can be really tough animals to keep. So if we're gonna promote this as a, as a tool for spatial separation, we're gonna to need to help producers get over that hump. We're gonna to need to help incentivize keeping these dogs um, so that they benefit wild sheep. They will also, in the places where they occur with carnivores, they'll also have that benefit for, for carnivores as well. So we can piggyback those sorts of things. So there's a lot of potential there, but there's a little bit of, of, um, of, a, of a, a, a hill for us to climb to get them to, um, to adopt these sorts of things, these sorts of practices. So interestingly, there's a big experiment coming up with fish, wildlife, and parks here in Montana. Um, and Wild Sheep Foundation are, are, are supporting and collaborating. And a number of, of different um, producers are all involved to look at exactly these practices. And so we're hoping, um, we're hoping to piggyback on, on that and learn a lot about the benefits of dogs and how we can help those dogs be better at keeping sheep out of uh, wild sheep out of the domestic sheep. So more on that, you know, probably, that's probably two years out now because that's going to be a long time coming that one. But it's a really exciting, um, it's a really exciting uh, prospect out there on the horizon. So as we look ahead, what's going to happen? Well, we have to keep training these dogs. I'll show you some data in a second. It's a complicated process. And, you know, managers handle 10 sheep in British Columbia and then 25 sheep in Nebraska and then 100 in, in South Dakota and then, you know, another 20 in Oregon. And, and so the samples coming in, it's slow. It takes a long time to get these samples coming in. And some of them, the dogs nail it every time. They're really good. And other times it's harder for them. So we need to tease that apart. And in order to do that, we're gonna use a lot of these other fancy um, uh, techniques like GCMS, that's gas chromatography. Um, there's uh, PCR is, is like DNA um, analyses. Microbiome, we can look at the gut flora of those animals and what's, what, what the dogs are, are figuring out is in the scat. And then there's a fancy uh, thing called PTRMS, which is it measures the weights of the volatile compound molecules. So we can know exactly what the dogs are smelling and see what's in it. Um, so we need to keep working on that so that we're able to figure out what they're, what they're smelling and how we can keep them doing it reliably. We're heading out, we're taking dogs out on the first two capture events in these next couple of weeks, one in South Dakota, one in, in, um, in uh, Nebraska. And, and that's really key. That's really important because there are two parts to every canine project. Can the dogs do it? Can they smell the target that we're after? They can always smell the target. They're really good at that stuff. Often the harder part is, can we fit the dogs into the workflow? 
into the process. So you saw those pictures of the captures. It's a, there are a lot of logistics, helicopters and people and samples and things going. Can we find a way to integrate the dogs into that process so that they're working efficiently and they're not, you know, losing their minds with all the distractions and craziness going on around them, but also doing it without disrupting or, or the safety and operations of all of that, um, that, that go, this goes on around them. So, and then the last thing is we're gonna do the aging experiments that I, that I mentioned to you to see how long it lasts. So that when a dog alerts to a scat in the field, we'll be able to say, well, that, that was a pos there was a positive sheep here less than a week ago, if that signal only lasts a week, or maybe if it lasts a month, it was a month, whatever. So we'll know exactly what it's telling us. And, and then th that can, we can put that information in the hands of the, of the managers. So um, we, are, we are still building this library of, of um, targets, target odors. Um, dog trainers are constantly after training samples. And the reason for that is that, that dogs like to get paid. They're just like us. <laughs> they like to get rewarded. They like to get paid. And if we, we have to be very clever about the ways that we train them because, um, because quite frankly, they will shortcut. Um, you know, we call it cheating, but it's not really cheating, but it's, it's, it's that, that, um, um, that they'll, they will, um, for example, we never use a, a sample from the same individual in training and in the testing phase. And the reason for that is dogs can just memorize the scent of an individual. So if they remember, you know, this is, this is you know, Joe the ram or Sally the, the ewe, and then they can alert to that animal again, only by recognizing the individual, not by focusing on their disease status. So that's why we need to, we're constantly turning over our samples. So we need lots and lots of samples. Um, the other challenge, um, and, we're also now working on nasal swabs, more than just scats, so nasal swabs. Only a two or three nasal swabs come from each sheep that's being handled. So it's not quite as abundant as scat. So those are hard to come by. So we need to keep, keep sort of collecting them. So Kevin and, and, and Kurt, and now all the people in the, the, the WAFWA, uh, the you know, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, Wild Sheep Initiative, they've all been fabulous, you know, sending us samples and, and helping and training. And we also need to know the status of those individual sheep that the samples come from, because then we can correlate it with, with what is the dog telling us? Are they smelling the bug? And here's the, here's the next slide. This is a very complicated slide. It's, it, 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 each one of those pie charts is focused on a single population of sheep and the colored wedges tell us what pathogens have been found in that population of sheep. And what you can see, mycoplasma is only one of those. I think it's the green one there but there are lots of other respiratory pathogens in all these sheep. So we need to, in a very rigorous way, understand whether our dogs are just alerting because they know that that individual has, is infected with a disease. Is it any disease? Or is it, it's infected with just a respiratory disease? Is that odor profile somehow different than, than a regular one? Or are they only alerting what we want them to do or trying to train them to do is only alert to mycoplasma ovi pneumoniae, just MOV, and get them just for that. But there are two kinds of MOV. You can have just an infection and, and not be acutely ill with it, or they can be um, really acutely ill and sick and, and, and dying of it. And each one of those things may have a different odor profile. So what we need to do is present the dogs again and again and again with MOV, 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 so that we know that that's what they're training on, and then we test them against all of those other respiratory pathogens and you know, other diseases you know, like manheimia or something like that, that they might have. So that's why we need so many samples and that's why it takes such a long time. And um, again, the Wild Sheep Foundation and others have been great. We have these um, sheets that explain how to collect them, how to, who to send it to, all of, all of that stuff. And now probably every sheep biologist in North America is tired of seeing it and getting it in their email inbox because <laughs> we, we were hitting them with all of it, but it's been fabulous. So we're, 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 we're getting lots of, of samples back. I just wanna mention in, in sort of wrapping up here, a couple other interesting you know, and, and, and somewhat important aspects of dog work, which one is everybody loves a good dog story, right? We're kind of a unique organization in that we, rec we rescue the dogs that we train. Right? So a lot of them, they're, they're coming from shelters, they failed out as other working careers, things like that. 
we, I can't tell you how often we work with biologists and they say, I've been doing this, you know, working on this species for 20 years, press never comes to see me. And then you guys show up with a dog and here comes the press, they're coming out of the woodwork, right? Because everybody loves it. Everybody loves it to see a dog and see him work and do all that stuff. So we've learned that you can actually leverage that. That's a really good way to get the message out and to talk to either policymakers or the general public or stakeholders or donors or you know the, the the legislature to justify their budgets and all that stuff. And what we've seen is that is that you know these stories they get picked up both locally and nationally. So that's Michelle Vasquez. She's the the one in South Dakota doing her masters on the left there. Um, she's there with Charlie. And that's Suta Calling Last. She's our collaborator on a Blackfeet environmental justice program. That story got picked up on NPR. It ran in 21 different states on their individual NPR stations and on the national, on national NPR. So it was just great. It was a fabulous sort of tool. But you know, the dogs are also really good as outreach to local communities, you know, the communities that we work in and, and as you know, stakeholders to say, hey, we're here. We're helping, we're helping to work on these issues and we're working with you. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's also as ambassadors for dogs in general, because people don't know that dogs can do these amazing things. So it, you know, often there's a day in the field where we do press or we do community outreach or something like that. And, and, and it opens a lot of doors to go with it. So um, here are all the coordinates for the, the, the sheep team sort of people. If any of you wants to reach out, um, uh, Kendra and Sarah know, have my coordinates and have everybody else's and they're, feel free to share them um, and you guys can reach out. And um, I will, uh, I don't have anything scheduled after this so I can hang out and answer questions as long as, um, as, long as you guys would like. Thanks, Pete, that was really wonderful. Sure, um, glad, would you like me to unshare the screen? Sure, I think it would make probably a lot bigger for folks to sure. see. Yeah. Can I throw one thing in? Sure. Yeah. I had one question for you before you stop sharing your oh, screen. Okay. We okay. spoke on earlier about the sheep wearing masks. When we were in Reno, you were showing pictures of how you're trying to get the like nasal stuff. Do you still have yep the pictures of that? <laughs> like yeah. just to share that one. We were doing this, we were doing this right when the mask thing, right in the early days of the pandemic when masks were becoming a, a political thing and, and people were talking about sheeple and we were laughing because, and our collaborators at MSU, they're just the best. They went around and they put these, you can see with the alligator clips, they put them on sheep and they let them wear them for a half an hour and, um, and, uh, and, and to get breath samples. And as you saw, you know, the dogs, they, they were able to, to discriminate just based on the, the, um, the breath samples. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was good fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, so now we can open it up for Q and A. Um, we see we don't have too big of an audience today, so if you have a question, just feel to feel free to unmute and um, go for it. Um, look, oh, first question here on the chat. This is okay. from Josh Evans. So Josh Josh asks, would it be easier to train guarding dogs to keep out all animals except for domestic sheep? Yeah, it it might be. Um, Interestingly, one of the things that they that that the the um, a lot of the producers tell us is that anything that splits the the domestic herd is is they'll they'll automatically go for and and keep them out. the The harder thing is 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 the single individual who just wanders in. So it could be, but what we don't want is a producer who is to either that dog's going to run themselves into the ground, you know, chasing every single you know deer or rabbit, you know, sort of other things or magnifying um, or having an adverse environmental sort of impact. You know, we want, we want the producers to be able to be in these landscapes without disturbing everything sort of around them. So that'll be some of the, um, some of the I guess you'd say the nuance um, for, for this, this the, the, the separation project is figuring out the best way for them to do it. And I think the producers are probably be the ones who, who can tell us the most about that. <clears throat> I'll go to Kevin who's first on my screen with his hand up. Yeah, just for those folks who weren't able to make it to Reno a month ago, um, just let you know that on Thursday night, conservation night, we had Pete, uh, he brought three of his staff, Amanda, Paige, and Michelle, and two dogs. And so on Thursday night, we had a demonstration trial on stage uh, with, I don't know how many people in the room, 1,500. And then the next day, 
Paige and Amanda walked the show floor with those dogs and uh, really interacted well with the folks that were there. So it's a really cool um, outreach program as Pete just described, but we see great, great uh, potential with this. And we're really excited about the South Dakota and Nebraska projects that are coming up within the next 30 days. And yeah. we wanna be able to compare, you know, overnight samples that are shipped to Waddle, contrast and compare that with field PCR, the biomeme unit, the detection dogs, and then there's a fourth analysis tool that's not quite ready for field trial yet. It's called LAMP. But uh, yeah, really excited about this project and glad that uh, Kurt and Pete sat down and had that first conversation because we think it's going to lead to some great things. Well, and and Kevin, you guys have been amazing opening doors for us. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've called cold and say, uh, so Kevin Hurley gave me your cell number. You know, and then, and then they go, oh, okay, what do you need? It's just been, it's been fabulous. It's been really great. And the, the, we have collaborators in Alberta who do zebra and quagga muscle work. They inspect boats and, and now they're doing some other stuff on weeds and things like that. But they took, um, it was, it's for Alberta Parks and, and Environment. And they took their, um, their public relations officer and they asked her, hey, we've gotten all this press with the dogs. And it, you know, impressions or eyeballs or how they measure all that stuff in newspapers and the web and stuff like that. And they said, how much would it cost if we wanted to do a public outreach campaign and reach that many people? And, and so she, she sat down and did the math. It was over a million dollars Canadian that they had in the first couple of years of that program that, you know, a free, basically free advertising that, you know, a few cute dogs and they have cute, you know, playing cards they do. It's almost like a baseball card. And they hand them out that says you've been sniffed and it has the dog's name and all that stuff. And those dogs are celebrities now, you know, so people roll up to the check stations and normally they're annoyed that somebody's going to have to inspect their boat and this and that. And they get out and they say, oh, is diesel here? Or is it diesel or is it Theo or, you know, whatever. So it's a really it's, it's just been it's great. It's really nice to, to to see people engage that way. Thank you, um, Steve, do you have a question? Yeah, <clears throat> Pete, thank you. Very interesting. And I think there's a lot of a lot of directions this could go. I know uh, in our state, we look at a, aquatic invasives and we just inspect them with human eyeballs and no noses and you know, things like that to have a dog at those stations. I mean, the, <clears throat> the possibilities are endless. I'm curious, though, it seemed like you spoke mostly about the dog tests being done, if not exclusively, with wild sheep. What's happening in the in the domestic sheep end of this equation? What's yeah. the reception been with producers? What's the potential there? Because I just see if we can yep. run run a couple of dogs to a domestic sheep herd and go, you're clean, go to the mountain. That would be yeah. quite helpful. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. So, um, so uh, at, at this early stage, basically, we're we're playing ball with the 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 willing and the interested. Um, and, and there are some, some really great sheep producers who are, who are very keen to, to do the right thing. And they've been, they've been great. And they're the ones who are showing up now. So, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm not naive enough to think they're representative of the whole industry, but there are a few thought leaders who are, who are playing ball and who are interested. The reason we started with domestic sheep was just that we can get hundreds of samples all at once from, from those sheep. And what's interesting is those sheep, um, so for, for many of you probably know this, that MOV is, is, is um, it can affect their weight gain and some of their productivity, but it's not an acute, they're not dropping dead of it um, in, in domestic sheep. So um, here at MSU, they've got an experimental flock, they call them S, uh, SPF sheep. They're born clean, they have no infections, and then they experimentally infect them. And so what that allowed us to do was have samples from before and after that infection from the same individual. So we know that the dogs aren't, you know, using uh, individual identities to, to do it. That was kind of the gold standard when we said they really can do this. And it's a much less acute infection. So it's probably not chain causing the whole huge systemic um, changes for them like it, like it would for wild sheep. So yes, we've done a lot with them. We will probably, we are gonna continue. And if this is a tool, ends up being a tool for domestic producers, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't wanna speak on behalf of any of the agencies. I have no authority over anything, over anyone or any wildlife, but wouldn't it be fabulous if, if, if you know, 
Forest Service or agency said, hey, sheep have to be clean before you can go, you know, um, graze in these bighorn habitats. We would love, we'd be thrilled to go um, and help them help them do that. It's a lot easier to get nasal samples, swabs from, from domestic sheep. Um, it's also interesting. I just did, I just gave a very similar talk to this at MSU at Montana State. And um, one of them said, oh, you should just do this with, with wool, with wool samples. He said, sheep are constantly sneezing on each other, wiping their noses on each other. So it's a pooled sample. The individual whose wool you're sampling may not be the one who is infected or not, but it'll, it, we can work on, on, on wool samples and producers keep wool samples. So that may be another way for us to help producers you know, know when they've got infected animals. The wiggle here is it's not easy to treat them. You probably know that. It's not easy to treat domestic and get rid of the infection. There are people working on it. Um, and um, you know, hopefully that'll that'll happen. But but yeah, my hope is that that we'll end up working on both sides of this interaction with the domestic and the wild sheep. Good questions. Um, from Josh Evans on the chat, what's the turnaround time for getting a sample from a sheep? to a positive dog. What is the turnaround time for getting a sample from a sheep to getting a positive test to a dog training? So at the, at the captures, if everything goes to plan, you know, um, at, at the captures, they will have nasal swabs and scat from individuals. The turnaround time from a dog is as soon as you can present it to them. The dog will give you an alert right then, tells you immediately. Um, so, so that dogs would be the fastest. The next would be the bio meme or the lamp machine. Um, and that does, you know, PCR DNA analysis right there in the field. And that takes about an hour. Am I right, Kevin? About an hour is what, what it's taken for those. And then, you know, sending it off to the laboratory, um, that's, that's FedEx. That's how long FedEx can do it. And then the guys climb the hill and with their cell phone and are trying to get a text back to hear, you know, sheep number 17 is positive, sheep number 15 is negative and stuff like that. So um, that's a much longer turnaround. The expectation is that that's the gold standard. That's the most reliable sort of answer. Um, uh, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we can get the dogs, particularly with fresh and with nasal swab samples, we can get the dogs up around the reliabilities, um, certainly of the field PCR machine, but even, um, um, even as good as the, the laboratory at Waddle. Go for it, Kevin. Yeah, so um, Pete referenced, you know, before a uh, domestic band is turned out on public land, say a Forest Service high elevation grazing allotment. The flip side of that coin, and this is a real life example out of the Wildcat Hills in Nebraska. Last August, Todd Nordeen and the Nebraska Game and Parks guys all of a sudden discovered two domestic goat operations that popped up like mushrooms overnight. They didn't know where they came from and they kiboshed their transplant into the Pine Ridge because of these two. And so just think it out loud. It's like if, if there would have been the capability of you know, running a detection dog through that set of corrals and say, you're clean, they might not have had to abandon their transplant uh, plans at the last minute. And so there are some real life applications, not only on these hobby herd farm flocks, but also on the big public land grazing allotments. Yeah. Yeah, great point, Kevin. You know, it's wonderful to see potential solutions that we're exploring um, with the work of folks like you and your team, Pete. What would be the biggest, you mentioned a few in your presentation, but if you were to identify your biggest challenge to answering some of the questions you have, what would they be? And how can National Bighorn Sheep Center and the foundation chapters and affiliates help? help? Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for asking that. Um, Right now, you know, the biggest, the, the biggest challenge we have is getting all of those samples, those training samples, and getting, having the dogs on the ground at the captures. You know, that's the, the, the bottleneck is, is cause, cause that's a rare event. Um, and um, so, but I, I, another shout out to Kevin and the Wild Sheep Foundation, not only have they opened their Rolodex and, and you know, everything, but they've opened their wallets. They're, they're supporting this, this, um, this work financially. We're now in the second year of this um, and we're, we're really excited. Like I said, we, we've thrown eight dogs at this um, project and that is very unusual for us to, to have that many dogs 
Um, that's a significant chunk of our, our pack, but we're doing it because it's, it's complicated. Um, it's difficult work, but it's also because it's really important. And the response, that's why the response from the, the agencies have been, has been so great. And so we just said, hey, I want to say yes every time we can. Um, so, um, we're, you know, we're really, we're, we're thrilled and, you know, quite honestly, I think this, we may only have to, 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 you know, reach into Kevin's pocket for this for a couple of years, because when you're paying a thousand dollars an hour to have a helicopter sitting there doing nothing, <laughs> the agencies, this is, this could save the agencies a lot of money. And then, and then they'll say, sure, pack up the dogs and we'll pay for your hotels and their fuel out all the way out here and all of that. So it really is. Um, it, it really has the potential to kind of take on a life of its own and keep going. And our model is: we're only 16 people, um, 16 people, and about almost now almost 50 dogs worldwide. And so, you know, really, once we demonstrate that this is this is possible, that it's rigorous, I would be thrilled to um, to have you know um, either some of the state agencies come to us and and we'll rescue dogs we'll train them we'll train the handlers and off they go and then we support them for the life of the project you know so they say oh this you know this dog's having a few problems hitting on false targets or you know not working in this environment very well and then we help them and clean them up and do all that stuff i would i would be thrilled to do that for some of the agencies for some of the tribes or or maybe it's for the the wild sheep foundation and then that 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 dog and handler team they just ride circuit and go to every capture all over the country um, because, you know, the logistics of these things, oh man, sometimes I think it'd be easier to invade some of these states than to, than to go catch a few wild sheep in them because you got to get the helicopters there and the trailers and the people and the units and then, and then it snows and the whole thing has to wait a week or whatever. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of logistics. So it'd be great to have a team that's just dedicated to do that. You know, and what Pete just described is a real life situation. And there's a biologist in anonymous biologist in North Dakota by the name of Brett Weedman who has already talked to Pete and he's got the best dog on the planet and so he's going to go out and get with Pete and see if his dog might be trainable for this but yeah I think that will gain a lot of traction yeah yeah we'd be thrilled we'd be thrilled because everything we do is open source so once we do something we share it with everybody we just say you can come you can come do it because because we're little we can't we can't be everywhere all at once um, and look to us to help with that outreach, Pete and, and Kevin. Um, Thank you. Hand up, yeah, hand up from Steve Kilpatrick. Yeah, Pete, um, I'd like to add on to Kevin's comment about, you know, sort of a, a domestic herd being deemed sort of clean. And I think one of the, one of the, Kevin and I have, over years have raised millions of dollars for allotment buyouts. The allotment buyouts have had huge impacts on the egg industry. Uh, I got to call a spade a spade here. And I think um, if we could get a talking point focused around the fact that if you were clean, you we wouldn't be buying out allotments. The Forest Service wouldn't be encouraging you or in some places, even policy wise, uh, having you move off of allotments as a producer because of the domestic sheep, wild sheep issue. So yeah. while while a lot of producers have said what you just said, hey, it's not costing me really a dime. It doesn't really affect my wool production or my meat production in domestic sheep. In the big picture, it may affect the range that they can run on. So I think that's a valid talking point and it kind of ties in what Kevin had to say. And I've used that and I've gotten some uh, kind of like, oh, ah, I never thought of that. So that right. might be something you think of is, we won't be in this battle over public lands at the level that we are today in terms of keeping separation if we could work with you guys. So yep. that's something they could gain as an from an industry perspective. Yep, yep, I think that's great. I, I totally agree. And I think as, as conservationists, you know, a lot of us and a lot of people perceive us this way and some of, some conservationists actually behave this way like, like spoiled toddlers, you know, saying, no, 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 you can't do that over there. You can't do that either, over there either. And you know, this is a genuine effort, you know, to to produce some some tools to make coexistence um, more more viable and and better, so that we don't have to to say no all the time. We can say, let's do this the right way. Yeah. And Sarah, if I can sprinkle a little bit of cold water on Steve, um, if if MOV is the only pathogen that we're worried about, 
And so there's quite a discussion going on among the wildlife vets for the Western agencies. I'm tickled that Dr. Kimberly Beckman with Alaska Fish and Game is on here tonight, but she could speak to this way better than I. But, you know, there's some people that are in the MOV camp and others that are still in the Manheimia and some of the other bacteria. So it's, it may not be quite that simple if, you know, if you could find a path forward on MOV, maybe there's still some other bugs out there that should be concerned about. Yeah, great point. Well, you have MOV dogs and you have Manheimia dogs, Kevin. Yeah, so Kimberly, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, if you have any thought on that, sure appreciate hearing. Well, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's going to be other pathogens in the future too. And I think that what you're doing here is, is fantastic and is very exciting. And um, I can see a lot of applications in the, in the future, but yeah, it, the MOV is, is a pathogen that is of concern and has an impact and, you know, it's not the only one. So, um, you know, and Manheimia can certainly um, cause disease and kill animals, but there's also animals that carry it and do just fine, you know, so it's kind of a similar situation. And I'm sure there's things out there that we have never detected before that we don't know about. <laughs> Because every time I look for something, I find something. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that, I, I think we're going to be doing this for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again for to, to Kevin Wild Sheep Foundation and, and to you know National Sheep Center for helping us get the word out. And I imagine a lot of you have have uh, have paid into to to some of the funds that Wild Sheep Foundation has helped us do it. So thanks all of you for both for tuning in, but also for supporting it. It's really great. We're honored to have you. We're honored to have this webinar series. Look forward to um, the future for 2023. Thank you all who's contributed to it. Um, and we'll make this recording available on our website. It should be up um, within definitely by Monday. So we'll make sure that gets to you, Pete. I just That's wanna- um, thank Kendra, my colleague, for helping put this together, and, and Kevin. So thank you. Thank you Good all. Job, Thanks, guys. See you all. Take care.